Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. If this is your first time listening to this channel, subscribe if you are someone who likes horror stories. Please leave a like before we get started. I upload every single night brand new stories. Thank you for joining me. It all started when my mum came barging into my bedroom, happy, joyful, and over the moon that dad had just booked us an Airbnb in Seattle for two whole weeks. My family weren't very close, but there were the odd few things that would bring us together. Weddings, anniversaries, and of course, holidays. Holidays were actually quite fun, or at least while I was growing up they were. We went camping, we went to the scouts hideout, we went hunting, and so on. Dad changed to a different person when we were on holidays. At home he was always sad, groggy and grumpy. But on holidays, it was like someone else took over his body. His soul would just be awakened. And I was looking forward to it. I looked up from my phone and gave my mum a smile. I guess it was an appreciative one, and she knew it was. We'd be going to an Airbnb in Seattle, and we'd be taking our cousins, my auntie, my uncle, and our grandma. The problem is, since our last holiday, we'd got a dog. A dog named Roxy. Roxy was a dog that we rescued two years ago, and I have to say that she had a handful of issues. She was a rescue dog, and we had to adopt her. She came from a place of pretty nasty abuse, and a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of unspeakable really. Training her to be natural and calm around humans again was extremely difficult. She tried to bark my grandma, auntie, and even my cousins. For a while we had to keep her on a muzzle, and even keep her leash very short, as around other dogs. Roxy was extremely unpredictable. However, I was a lot more relaxed now. The Airbnb in Seattle was surrounded by woodland, the yard was over four acres, and there wasn't anyone around us. That meant that I could keep Roxy on the long leash, and, as of current, she got on with my neighbours and my family a lot better. Training was good. To begin with, she didn't respond to it. But as the months went by, she started to get addicted to those little treats that I was giving her. This meant that she decided to actually listen to me, stop growling and snarling at people, and actually treat them kindly. I understand that all that just comes from a place of fear, probably because of what happened to her at our old home. After mum left the room, I decided that I was going to get up and join mum and dad in the living room. They were watching TV. But dad had his laptop on his lap as he was scanning through some of the listings on Airbnb. Dad was using this weird extendable cable to connect what he was looking at on his phone to the laptop. Kind of like a HDMI cable with the laptop to a TV if he wanted to stream a film on an illegal site. As I interrupted him, I brought up the question of Roxy. How was she going to get along with the family? It had been a while since she had tried to bite anyone, and she was actually obeying our commands now. But I still was slightly nervous. Dad turned around, awkwardly bending his neck to look back at me. She'll be fine. Don't worry. We'll just keep a close eye on her. It did reassure me, but I knew, as usual, I'd be the one left with her. Since Roxy got difficult... I was the one that take care of her every day, and it became a bit monotonous. Fast forward to the morning of the holiday, my grandma got picked up by my auntie and brought over to our house, along with the rest of our family and our cousins. We were all going off in a convoy of two trucks, or slash rangers, not actual trucks as in trucker trucks. I realised that I didn't really like the idea of being cramped in a car with five or six other people all breathing the same air. I don't have claustrophobia, but I have to say, 
that having Roxy in the footwell right beneath me and my grandma breathing on top of me to the left, it wasn't very comfortable for a seven hour journey. We stopped off halfway as my grandma needed to use the restroom. While we used the restroom, we took that opportunity to go and get some food. Roxy stretched her legs and went for a little jog with me. We weren't allowed to stay for long, as Dad wanted us to get there before it got dark, and we hadn't set off until around 10am, because we were all late getting ready. When we finally arrived, I couldn't believe how open and spacious the whole place was. A forest, but with a massive clearing in the middle. The house was made of nothing but wood, and from the inside, it looked empty. There wasn't very much furniture at all. In total, there were over seven bedrooms, so just imagine like a massive big cabin, but with seven bedrooms. It looks like a real house, but it's made of wood, probably the trees that are surrounding it. As we all settled in and picked our bedrooms, we finally got Roxy and took her for a walk around the grounds. She was loving it, all the squirrels, the wildlife and the birds chirping, they were sending her senses crazy. I decided that I was going to cut the walk short, I started to feel a little tired and fatigued and I was also really hungry. While I was on the walk, mum was cooking up burgers and fries, she had bought some frozen meat from the supermarket and at the time, also had some fries that were in the freezer pack that she bought with us in the truck. I got back in, and was instantly hit by the smell of burgers. There's nothing better than that smell. Oh boy, grilled cheese, or grilled halloumi, all over a prime beef burger. I made myself comfortable, waiting at the laid out dinner table. Once again, I was sat next to my grandma, Unfortunately, my grandma doesn't talk very much. I don't know why. She likes to just watch people, stare at them, and smile. We just smile back and sometimes wave. Sometimes, I kind of feel sorry for her. She had a tough life, and growing up she went for a lot, which is totally irrelevant to this story, so I won't go into it. Once the food was served, I stuffed my face. I even begged mum for seconds, which she obliged. Then, I head up to my bedroom. Roxy was due to stay with me, as her bed had been put at the end of mine. A small, three foot by three foot, cosy cushion, which has a gap in the middle where her body can sink into it. Kind of a cool design. She had had it now for the past half a year. She enjoyed it, but at first she was a little weirded out by it, and used to just lie on the hard floor in my bedroom. The next day, the whole family were due to go out. I didn't really want to go out as they said that they were heading into the centre of Seattle, they were going shopping, grocery store shopping, and going to one of the malls. I asked if I could stay home with Roxy, seeing as we wouldn't be able to take Roxy into the mall or the grocery store, and it was boiling hot, she'd have to stay in the car most of the day, which would just be dangerous. Mum and Dad said that I could stay with her, so I was left at the Airbnb. They left me a set of keys and also told me what to do if I needed them. There was no cell phone signal out here, which wasn't great, but it was the middle of the day, so I wasn't exactly worried. There were a lot of other cabins further up the tracks, so every once in a while, around once an hour, there would be another vehicle driving past the log cabin and going further up to their own. I decided that I was going to just chill out in the yard, the yard being acres upon acres, and more like a fucking huge field. I was out with Roxy, it was getting very hot. She took turns between lying in the sun, and then lying in the shade. It got to the point where it was around 1pm, her intervals of lying in the sun and then shade turned into 10 seconds of lying in the sun, and 10 minutes of lying in the shade. She'd also been drinking a whole lot of water. I went inside to get myself some lunch. The whole time Roxy had been connected to the leash, the long leash which I had tied round one of the beams connecting to the porch of the cabin. It was tight, extremely tight, and there was no way she was breaking free from that, no matter what she saw. 
When I got inside, I went over to the fridge and grabbed myself some watermelon. After I ate that, I made myself a couple of sandwiches and got a bag of chips out of one of the cupboards to the left of the kitchen. By the time I came back outside, Roxy was still lying in the shade, just panting like crazy with her tongue out, super, hyper, mega extended. I remember looking at her thinking, wow, your tongue is so huge, it's like longer than your entire face. The evening came closer. It was now 3pm and I hadn't heard from mum and dad, but that was understandable, as I know that there was no signal. There was a landline that you could connect, but it would only connect you through to the owner of all the cabins. It was a wire that led from the top of the house all the way out to some weird beams or poles by the driveway. These beams or poles ran all the way down the tracks and went to the roofs of all the cabins. This number was only to be used in emergencies, so of course I wasn't going to touch it. It was 4pm, then 5pm, and eventually I started to get really worried. Meanwhile, Roxy was loving it. I'd given her her dinner, and she had also started to enjoy the fact that it was cooling down outside, and the sun was starting to move away. She was a lot more active now. It was a lot cooler, at least 3 to 5 degrees cooler. She was now walking around most of the yard on her long extendable leash, and that's when I noticed she kept going over to a corner right by the edge of the cabin. At first, she was just sniffing a whole bunch, like a lot, excessive sniffing that didn't really catch my attention. I know that dogs sometimes pick up scents, ones they like or ones they don't like, for examples like mating or marking territory, etc. But what she did next got my attention. Roxy started trying to dig at one of the bits of earth with her paws. Roxy, stop. Roxy, stop. I started yelling, but she ignored me and just kept digging and digging. Intervals would be broken by her sniffing, then she'd go back to digging, then sniffing. I went over to her and tried to pull her away, but then curiosity got the better of me, and I started to wonder what she'd actually found. I decided that I would just kneel there. I'd given up on trying to stop her from digging up this section of the yard, and although the dram was pretty bone dry, she was still managing to churn it up with her fairly short claws. She had now dug around four inches down. It was impressive. Her sniffing was going crazy. It was like she knew something was there, but she didn't know how far down it was. She'd been digging now for around five minutes. She was causing a hell of a mess in the yard, and I was starting to think that I'd get into a lot of trouble when Dad got back. Eventually, I started to look closer as the earth she was digging changed a colour. It went from being a more dry, yellowy colour to a darker style, brown or black. In amongst this, something caught my attention. Immediately, Roxy saw it too. She lunged in with her mouth and grabbed whatever it was in between her teeth, turning round and then trying to run off. I don't know if it was a toy some kind of a squeaky bone or a ball. I didn't get chance to see it. It looked like white or kind of pinkish. As I ran over to her, she kept trying to run away from me. It wasn't working. She was way faster than me and the leash was way too long. So I decided to grab the leash and reel her in by pulling her further and further to me, making the leash shorter every second. As she got closer to me, the more I brought the leash in, I was absolutely horrified at what I could see in her mouth. To me, at first, it looked like a stick but white. Then, when she got closer, I grabbed her mouth. She growled at me, and I was scared because it brought back the memories of the days when we first rescued her. In her mouth was what looked like a human finger. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and immediately, Roxy tried to snarl and show her teeth. I knew exactly what was coming after that, so I let go of her mouth 
and let her keep the finger. At this point, I didn't know whether to call the line or to just wait until mum and dad get home. Hey, yeah, I found a human finger on your Airbnb backyard. You might want to come and see it. What was I supposed to say? Wouldn't that sound stupid? Was the owner related to this? Would they know something about it? And was it even a real human finger? Or was it just some kind of a prosthetic or dummy finger? I ended up waiting until mum and dad came back. I only had to wait half an hour as I heard the truck coming up the hill with all my cousins and my auntie inside. My grandma was no use to any of us in this situation as like I said, she wouldn't have even spoken about anything. I'd left Roxy in the corner of the cabin. She had tried to go inside after I grabbed the finger off her a second time. I tried to, but it was a failure. When mum and dad came out of the truck, I ran straight over to them. I'll admit, I was an absolute mess. I was crying and couldn't actually believe that Roxy may or may not have had a real human finger in her mouth. Dad went running inside and ended up getting bitten by her twice trying to take the finger off her. Then he called the line that we were told to call by the cabin owners. They arrived and then called the cops. The area was cordoned off, we were all questioned, and the Airbnb and the yard was searched by the police. I don't know what they found after that, as they never told us or gave us any closure. As far as I'm aware, they didn't find any other body parts. I don't know if they told my dad what happened, but if they did, he didn't tell me for whatever reason. Yeah, this is my story of finding a finger at my Airbnb, but my dog stopped me from getting it, and tried to get me to chase her around the whole yard, and then tried to bite me, and did bite my dad multiple times. I remember the day that my new neighbour moved in. I was only 10 years old at the time, and I was excited to have someone new to play with in the neighbourhood. Her name was Mrs Jenkins, and she was a woman in her 60s, curly white hair, bright blue eyes. She seemed friendly enough when she introduced herself, and offered my family some homemade cookies as a welcome gift. At first, I was thrilled to have a new friend. Mrs Jenkins was always eager to talk, and she seemed genuinely interested in my life. She would often invite me over to her house to play board games or watch movies, but as time went on, I started to feel weird around her. There was something about her that made me feel uncomfortable, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. As I got to know Mrs Jenkins, I realised that she was a bit weird. She would always wear long flowing dresses, even when it was hot outside, or freezing. Her house was filled with really old strange objects. She had trinkets that she claimed were from all over the world. But the strangest thing about her was her obsession with cats. She had at least a dozen of them, and she would often talk to them as if they were her children. Despite this, I tried to be nice to Mrs Jenkins. After all, I was only young, she was our neighbour, and my parents always taught me to be kind to others. But the more I spent time with her, the more I realised that she was not just odd, she was downright creepy. She would often say strange things to me, like how I had such lovely hair, or how I reminded her of her sister or daughter who passed away many years ago. One day, 
When I was 12 years old, I went over to Mrs. Jenkins' house to return a book that she had lent me. As soon as I walked in, I felt some weird fear wash over me. Mrs. Jenkins had a strange glint in her eye, and she kept staring at me with a smile that seemed almost sinister. I quickly handed her the book and tried to make an excuse to leave quickly. But, before I could, she locked the door behind me. I panicked and tried to open the door, but it was locked from the inside. Mrs. Jenkins stood in front of me, blocking the only exit. You can't leave just yet, my dear, she said with a smile. I've got to tell you something. I could feel my heart pounding as I realized that Mrs. Jenkins was not the kind and friendly neighbor I thought she was. She was dangerous. I started to scream for help, but Mrs. Jenkins just tried to quiet me. Shh, don't worry, don't worry, shh. I was terrified and I didn't know what to do. I thought I was going to be trapped in her house forever. But just then, I heard a loud banging on the door. It was my mum who had come looking for me when I didn't come home for dinner. My mother demanded that Mrs. Jenkins let me go, and after a few moments of hesitation, she finally unlocked the door, making up the most random excuse ever. I ran into my mum's arms, crying and shaking. My mother was furious and demanded an explanation from Mrs. Jenkins. But all she said was, I just wanted to spend more time with my little dear friend. My mum quickly grabbed my hand and we left, never looking back or talking to Mrs. Jenkins. After that incident, my parents made sure to always keep an eye on me whenever I was outside. They also warned the other neighbours about Mrs. Jenkins and advised them to stay away from her. As for me, I never went near her house again. I was too afraid of what she might do. Years went by and I grew up, but I never forgot about Mrs. Jenkins and the fear she had instilled in me. I always wondered what had made her behave the way she did. Was it just loneliness? Or was she actually attracted to me? I never got the answers to my questions. I was okay with that. I avoided her like the plague. I was just grateful to have escaped that day. I couldn't believe it. It was finally happening. I was now 18 years old. After years of dreaming and planning, my friends and I were going on our first big trip without my parents. We had decided to go to Yellowstone National Park, a place where we had all been fascinated with since we were kids. We arrived at the Airbnb rental, a cozy cabin, not too far from the park itself. Being away from my neighbour Mrs. Jenkins, my mum and my dad, was now a gift. Mrs. Jenkins was now in her 70s and was acting even more creepy around me than she was when I was younger. Well, we ended up getting greeted by the host. She seemed nice enough. As we settled in and unpacked, we were looking around the place, sorting out our snacks, drinks and our food. Then we started making plans for the trip. My friends didn't seem to notice anything wrong with the place, but I was obsessed with checking that everything was unlocked and lockable. That's what you get for living near Mrs. Jenkins. The first few days of our trip were amazing. We explored the park, hiked to breathtaking waterfalls, and marveled at the natural beauty around us. But as the days went on, things were more and more weird. Yeah, the vibe that I got from Mrs. Jenkins, for some weird reason, just came back. Now, that's when everything really really bad started to happen. One night, while we were cooking dinner, we heard a loud banging on the door. I walked over it, 
thinking, who the hell's this? At first, my friends told me to ignore it, but the banging continued, getting louder and more persistent. My friends and I exchanged worried glances before cautiously approaching the door. Suddenly, the door flew open, and there stood Mrs. Jenkins. Yep, her hair was dishevelled, she had just let herself into the Airbnb, and on top of all that, had managed to find out where we were. She pushed past us and stormed into the cabin, ranting about how we were ignoring her and how she just wanted to be a part of our trip. We were taken aback by her sudden outburst and tried to calm her down, but she wouldn't listen. After what felt like hours of rambling, she finally left, leaving us shaken and unsure of what to do. We decided to call the Airbnb host and let her know about Mrs. Jenkins. To our surprise, she seemed unsurprised and even hinted that this wasn't the first time something like this had happened to the Airbnbs that she owned. She bat off any responsibility and said that any drama we bring into her property was up to us, not her. Feeling uneasy, we made sure to lock all the doors and windows before going to bed that night. I rang my parents telling them that Mrs. Jenkins had somehow found out where I was staying with my friends. Around midnight, I woke up to the sound of someone trying to open the front door. My heart raced as I heard Mrs. Jenkins' voice whispering my name from outside. I woke my friends up and we huddled together, terrified as we heard her trying to break in. Thankfully, Mrs. Jenkins eventually gave up, and we didn't hear from her for the rest of our trip. But the experience had left us shaken, and we couldn't wait to leave and get back home. Huh. <laughs> Except me, because I lived right next to her. I reported all of this to the police. They asked me if I wanted to get an order out against her but they then brought up how difficult and strenuous that would be, seeing as she was my next-door neighbour, ten metres away from where I lived. As we were packing to leave, Mrs. Jenkins showed up one last time. This time, she was acting really unusual, apologising for her behaviour, and saying that she just wanted to be friends. But we knew better than to trust her, and quickly loaded our bags into the car and drove away. Looking back, our trip to Yellowstone was filled with an amazing set of memories, breathtaking sights, but it was also marred by the unsettling presence of my creepy neighbour who's been ruining my life now for the past nine years. We learn to always trust our instincts, and to be cautious when staying in unfamiliar places. And although it was a scary and uncomfortable experience, it made our trip all the more unforgettable. As I stepped into the old Victorian house, it was an Airbnb that I realised was probably a bad idea. The creaky floorboards, the dark hallway, the place just had an awful atmosphere. However, I reassured myself that I was just thinking this wrong. After all, I was only staying here for a week while I attended a conference nearby. I'd found the listing for this on Airbnb. It seemed like a decent choice. The host, Millie, was a sweet lady in her 50s. She lived alone and had an extra room to rent out. The reviews were all positive, 
praising her hospitality and delicious home-cooked meals. I thought it would be a great opportunity to experience a home away from home. Millie welcomed me with a warm smile and showed me to my room. It was a cosy and well-decorated place, with a large window that overlooked the backyard. As I settled in, Millie told me about the history of the house and all the guests that she had hosted over the years. She seemed like a kind and gentle soul, but something about her... I don't know. She seemed lonely, but in a bad way that made all our conversation extremely awkward. The first few days went by smoothly. I attended my conference during the day and came back to the peaceful Airbnb at night. Millie would always have dinner prepared for me, and we would chat about our days over a cup of tea. As the weeks went on, I noticed that Millie seemed more tired and frail. She would often pause mid-conversation, touching her chest and taking deep breaths. I couldn't help but worry about what was actually going on here, and I wondered if this was actually normal, and if she had any family. On the day of my departure, Millie woke up early. She also woke me up early, insisting on making me breakfast for the last morning I'd spend with her. I tried to say no, but she insisted, saying it would be her treat. As I sat in the kitchen table, sipping on my coffee, Millie suddenly grabbed her chest and let out a gasp. I jumped up from my seat, asking if she was okay. She shook her head. Tears were welling up in her eyes. I can't feel my chest, she managed to say before collapsing onto the floor. My heart raced as I frantically searched for my phone. I dialed for the ambulance, trying to remember Millie's address. I could hear her laboured breathing, and my own panicked thoughts echoed in my mind. When I finally gave the address to the operator, I rushed to Millie's side, trying to calm her and lay her in a more comfortable position. The ambulance arrived in what felt like hours, but in reality, it was only a few minutes. They quickly took Millie, and I followed close behind in my rental car. I was a nervous wreck, praying that Millie would be okay. At the hospital, I waited anxiously for any news. The doctors said that she had suffered a heart attack, but was now stable. She would need to stay in the hospital for a few days. I breathed a sigh of relief, grateful that she was going to be okay, but I knew that I couldn't stay with her for much longer. As I sat by Millie's bedside, she apologised for making the situation so much worse that morning. I reassured her that it wasn't her fault, and that I was just glad that she was going to be okay. She told me that she had been feeling unwell for a while, but didn't want to cancel on me because she didn't want to disappoint me. Tears welled up in my eyes as I realised the sacrifices and loneliness Millie had just been through, just to make my stay comfortable. She was a kind and selfless woman, and couldn't help but feel guilty for not paying more attention to her health. The rest of my stay was spent helping Millie around the house and keeping her company. There was only one day left, but I decided to extend my trip, wanting to make sure that she was fully recovered before I left. Eventually, it was time for me to go back home. Millie hugged me tightly, thanking me for taking care of her. As I drove away from the Airbnb, I thought that I was leaving this lady behind. I felt guilty, and I felt a sense of abandonment wash over me. I had taken Millie's cell phone number, but she barely knew how to use her own phone. The way she used Airbnb was booking through the app, and even then, she still made a whole bunch of mistakes while trying to book people in for the future, which she ran through with me. I messaged her a couple of times, 
She replied once, but after this we may needed calls. I kept doing updates and asking her how her health was. I also asked her about her guests and if everything was okay. I came up with the idea of bringing a system in place, a security system for her. She had no locks on her doors and she has no idea who's coming to stay with her. It just didn't sit right with me, but with Millie, she didn't seem to even think about it. I couldn't believe my luck when I found this amazing deal on Airbnb, a cottage in the countryside for only $50 a night. It seemed like the perfect getaway for a weekend, so I just booked it without any hesitation. As I drove up the road towards the cottage, I noticed how secluded this place really was. The nearest neighbour seemed to be miles away and the only sounds were the rustling of trees and the occasional chirping of birds. It was peaceful, but also a little eerie. I parked my car and made my way up to the cottage, taking in the stunning views of the countryside. The cottage itself was quaint and charming. There was a cosy porch and a small garden filled with colourful flowers. I couldn't wait to settle in and finally just relax, kicking my feet up for good. But, as soon as I stepped inside, I knew something just was off. The air was musty. There was a strange, pungent smell lingering in the air. I thought that maybe it was just because it was an old cottage, and maybe it needed some airing out or ventilation. I went on to unpack my things and decided to explore the rest of the building. It was small, just one bedroom, a living room and a kitchen, but it was well decorated and had a cosy, homely feel to it. As the sun began to set, I settled in for the night, but as soon as I turned off the lights, I heard it, the scurrying and scratching of tiny feet. My heart raced as I realised that I was not alone in the cottage. I turned on the lights and searched for the source of the noise, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I convinced myself that it was just my imagination and I tried to get back to sleep. But as soon as I turned off the lights again, the sound returned. This time, they were louder. I couldn't ignore it any longer and decided to investigate further. I turned on the lights and headed towards the kitchen where the sound seemed to be coming from or at least that's where it was the noisiest. As I opened the cabinets, my worst fears were confirmed. The cottage was infested with rats. I screamed and ran out of the cottage, grabbing my phone and calling the Airbnb owner. Obviously, with how late it was, there was no answer. I was stranded in this rat-infested cottage with no one to help me. I tried to calm myself down and think of a solution. I remembered seeing a hardware store on my way to the cottage and decided to go there first thing in the morning to get some traps and poison. I wasn't even thinking straight, and other than trying to call the owner that time, in the middle of the night with no answer, I now was acting as if this place was my own damn house, and thinking back, I have no idea why I went to all this effort, but I think subconsciously, I had some thoughts in my mind that told me the owner would try and say it's normal, or just wouldn't give me my money back. As I lay in bed, 
trying to block out the sounds of the rats that night. I felt awful. Why would the owner not mention the rat infestation? Well, because they don't want to turn away guests. Why were there no rats or signs of rats when I arrived? The next morning, I woke up to find the rats had gotten into my food and had chewed through my suitcase. I was livid and decided to call the Airbnb owner again. This time, someone picked up. Hello? A gruff voice answered. Hi, this is the guest staying at your cottage. I just wanted to let you know that there's a rat infestation here, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Oh, don't worry about that. They usually stay in the walls and don't bother anyone, the owner replied, nonchalantly. I was taken aback by their lack of concern, but they got into my food and damaged my belongings, so that was a step too far. Yeah, They've eaten my food and chewed through my bags, I said, trying to control my frustration. Well, I can send someone to put some traps out for you, but that's about all I can do, the owner said, before abruptly hanging up on me mid-call. I couldn't believe it. Not only was I stuck in this rat-infested cottage, but the owner didn't seem to care at all. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I went to that hardware store. As I was browsing the aisles, I looked around. I heard a noise behind me, but as I turned, there was no one there. I grabbed what I needed. Then, when I got back to the cottage, I set up the traps and the poison in strategic places where I'd heard them the night before. I also made sure to seal any holes or cracks that the rats could use to get in. This way, I could kill the ones that were already in the house, and no new ones could get in. But this method only worked if I had found all the holes that they got in from, and most likely I hadn't. Even with all my precautions, I couldn't shake off the feeling that there were still clearly holes somewhere around the cottage that I hadn't covered. I kept hearing strange noises and felt like I was being watched. Eventually, I tried to distract myself by reading a book, but I couldn't focus. As the night went on, the sounds of the rats seemed to get louder and more persistent. I was too scared to turn off the lights and go to sleep, so I stayed up all night, keeping a watchful eye. The next morning, I was exhausted and on edge at the same time. I checked the traps and was relieved to find a few rats caught in them. But, as I was disposing of the rats, I heard a knock on the door. I cautiously opened it to find a man standing there, dressed in overalls and holding a toolbox. Hello, I'm the exterminator, he said with a friendly smile. I let out a sigh of relief and let him in. The Airbnb owner had clearly organized this and did kind of care after all. He quickly got to work, setting up more traps and sealing any potential entry points. As he worked, he told me that the cottage was known for its rat infestations and that the owner was well aware of it. Apparently this had happened more than seven times, and that's why the Airbnb owner had acted so rude with me, because they were so pissed off that this was happening yet again. I couldn't believe it. How could the owner continue to rent out this cottage to unsuspecting guests? I was furious, and decided to leave a scathing review on Airbnb. As I was packing my bings up and getting ready to leave, the exterminator made a chilling revelation. Be careful, miss. These rats are not just ordinary rats. They're known to be carriers of a deadly disease, he said, his voice filled with concern. My blood ran cold as I realized the gravity of the situation. 
I had been staying in the cottage for two nights, breathing in the same air as these disease-carrying rats. I left the cottage as quickly as I could and headed straight to a doctor to get checked out. Thankfully, I was fine, but the experience left me traumatized. I never went to set foot in that cottage again, or an Airbnb for that matter, and I'll always be wary of booking through Airbnb. You never know what horrors may be lurking in the shadows, waiting to pounce on unsuspecting guests. I think that the owners could have done a much better job of actually seeming concerned. Rightfully, most of you have pointed out that she should have definitely given me a full refund and then completely blitzed the place, making sure that it was 100% squeaky clean and rat free. Clearly though, they just got any old exterminator for probably 10 bucks an hour down the road. It was clear to me that this guy wasn't a professional. What he was wearing, his tools, the way he was speaking. There are so many points that screamed, I'm under quality labor. When I went home, I realized how grateful I really was to have a clean house. Even if my house isn't the biggest, it's still a similar size to that tiny, cramped, rat-infested cottage. And... This is the most bizarre experience of my entire life. I don't know if rats bite people regularly. I'm guessing you have to actually attack them for them to then bite you out of self-defense. But if they had of, then I guess there's a possibility that I could have caught the diseases that they were carrying. Yuck. Disgusting animals. I really don't like them. I'm sorry. How can some people actually keep these things as pets? I can understand mice, snakes or lizards, even those weird Komodo dragon things. Obviously they're a bit weird and out there, but this? A rat? Really? Ladies and gentlemen, guys, thank you so much for making it to the end of today's stories. If you enjoyed tonight's horror stories and you're new to my channel, please consider joining the channel by clicking subscribe in the bottom of this video. Also, please click the bell, which is next to the red subscribe button. It notifies you when I upload my videos as a lot of my subscribers don't actually get notified for some weird reason. Please leave a like before you leave, and also feel free to comment down below your opinions or your thoughts on any of the stories in today's video. Here in this channel I try to upload every single night. This is a one-man army, I don't have any teams behind me, I have no sponsorship deals or contracts, I'm not part of any networks or Uh, relationships with any uh, companies or you know sponsor deals and also I don't sell anything which is important to note no silly mugs or t-shirts and while I'm not 100% against people who have merchandise I understand why they do it but I also just don't see the point in it personally I'd rather you guys simply leave a like and a comment and just keep coming back to my videos each evening I think that's a much better way to support me As after all, a mug with the word Slessler on is probably completely pointless. Let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm really uh, kind of uh, struggling with some of these videos as um, it's a lot of work. But the reason I keep doing it is because I enjoy it. And I also see the channel growing a little bit. Just a little bit. I know you guys are working hard to help share my videos. But the niche is very, very uh, full now with all these AI channels. I don't want to ramble on too long about the AI channels, but if you're a regular, you'll know how um, I've said about this, that the AI channels are starting to try and now take over, in my opinion. Uh, TikTok is basically all just AI now, which is unfortunate. And we're trying to keep the human spirit, the creativity of the soul alive. 
and I think a real human voice is never going to be beaten by any computer. Uh, I just think there's something about the vocal tones, the vibration of it. I may sound like I'm going a bit crazy here, like spirituality-wise, but I, I really think, and I promise you guys, I will never turn to AI for the voice. I know some channels that have kind of done that, and they've kind of sold out, and they've turned to AI, they've started stealing stories on Reddit, or they re-upload all the same stories into one five-hour video. Uh, this is, uh, again, just company corporate sponsorship related channels that are in it just a hundred percent for the money and not at all for the viewers so yeah please support my channel by coming back and uh, choosing me over other horror story channels that might also yeah, basically just be trying to sell you something and using ai so thank you and i'll catch you in tomorrow's upload